Right, so Ken has uh, kindly agreed to, uh, to do a little fireside chat with us and we'll open it up uh, for Q&A in, in a little while. Um, but um, I know that you're a great uh, student of Napoleon and uh, there's a particular leadership uh, quote that you uh, are very fond of recounting. What, what is that quote and why, why are you so fond of it? So it's a quote that I paraphrased and I came across it uh, when I was 21 years old. And that is that the role of a leader is to define reality and give hope, which to me is the most simple definition of leadership. And it's something literally I think about every day because in every situation, while it's a simple quote, we know how difficult it is to define reality because you have a lot of perspectives on what reality is and you sometimes have to do deep analysis to understand the reality. There, there are questions that don't seem like they can be answered. So stepping back always or leaning forward to define reality is critical. But then what's important is I think what a real leader does is you gotta capture the hearts and minds of people. And what a leader needs to do is how do you give people hope? What are the strategies? What are the tactics? What are the values? What are the relationships that you have to create? What's the trust and integrity that you have to exhibit to, to build enduring relationships and to build leadership? And so that's, to me, a uh, defining quote uh, that I don't think anyone ever lives up to uh, on a consistent enough basis, but it's a quote that I strive to live up to. So, so if we go back to when you started with American Express, um, what was the reality that you had to define when you became CEO, and what hope did you have to give at that point, and how did it work out? So I think one of the things that was important is my predecessor, uh, this person by the name of Harvey Golub, who was really, I think, an outstanding mm -hmm. CEO, uh, who was very <coughs> instrumental in bringing about important change at the company. And we developed uh, a very close relationship. But one of the things we often talked about is that success for a person or a company can become a rut. Because the reality is you, you develop a level of confidence that if you're not careful becomes arrogance. And uh, that was something that American Express, particularly in the 80s and 90s, we really had to uh, fight against in the company. But one of the things that I recognized uh, was that American Express had to continue to innovate. We had started down the road of a digital transformation. Uh, but what was very clear was we needed to substantially accelerate that transformation. And the way I define that reality, John, was we need to become the, the company that will put us out of business. Uh, because I think at the end of the day, despite the fact that we were successful, I think part of what you want to do in any organization is to identify what's the burning platform. And the burning platform for us was that American Express had to accelerate the level of innovation and change, and at the same time, retain the core values. And for American Express, was the reality is a tremendous heritage of service, uh, which I think is really defining about the company uh, for 170 plus years. This has been a company that has gone through a lot of transformation. But the constant has been this commitment to service. And so one was to say to the organization, very successful, but in fact, we were still a payments company. And what I wanted to do in the company was to have people focus on the fact that we weren't really a payments company. We were a platform company. And we were a platform company that delivered service and services to a range of companies, and just in this era, it was through payments. And so that, that concept was very challenging 
for a period of time. And then I'll let you get into some other challenges, but obviously in that first year, we had 9-11. I think that uh, is the next question. So I think the important point there is I had been CEO for seven months, uh, and the company was doing well. And I would say the emotional impact and the business impact was very significant. And I'll just give you one or two stories, because one of the things I think that's important in a company in defining a culture is to understand what the stories are. And so this was really uh, a very, very challenging story. Uh, I was in Salt Lake City uh, when uh, the attack happened. And I literally had the TV on but the sound off because I was on a conference call with a group that was in the conference room. American Express headquarters were right across the street from the World Trade Center. And, um, uh, and so it was incredible that I saw the plane hit the uh, World Trade Center and the screams from the conference room because they were facing the World Trade Center. And then obviously, silence. Um, and uh, so I was by myself and um, seeing something that was un imaginable. Uh, and what did I have to think about? Obviously, I thought about my family, and I thought about our people, and I thought about all the people. I didn't know the extent of what had happened, uh, but I knew it was truly horrible. And then the reports came in, and I could not communicate with anyone in New York. Uh, my family or anyone in the company. And uh, fortunately, I was able to connect with some of our security people. And so what I had to think through was, one, what were the most important priorities? Well, one, the most important priority was to ensure the safety and security of our people. I did not know the extent of the damage yet. And so, uh, one, I tried to think through what could we do to ensure the safety and security of our people. What could we do for our customers uh, to take care of their needs all around the world? And then, very importantly, how would I get in contact? And so I was able uh, to call someone on their cell phone uh, and to say, get our top management people together. Then I was told we had lost uh, 11 of our colleagues who were in the World Trade Center. Um, and um, uh, who were in our travel business, uh, that everyone had to evacuate the building. They didn't know what other casualties <clears throat> there were. And uh, I got our top 20 people together. And what I said to them is that this is a moment from a leadership standpoint that we had to lead, and we had to lead lead with decisiveness and compassion. And I think the point here is that that's what I think you have to do from a leadership standpoint. And some leaders don't like to talk about <laughs> compassion. Uh, and they get confused that compassion means you're weak. No, compassion means, in fact, you can engage with people and you care about people. That takes strength. That takes character. And decisiveness means that despite that personal relationship, despite that compassion, you have the willingness to make very difficult decisions that will affect people. And so I'll just give you one example of that, is a week later, I thought I can't reach enough people in the company, and we had to evacuate our buildings. We were spread out into 10 different locations in uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York. So we rented out Madison Square Garden. We brought all of our people together that we could. And what was important there is uh, 
well-meaning people in our public relations staff said, Ken, we're going to put some talking points together for you. I said, no, you're not. This is such as I just got to talk to people, and the worst thing would be to sit there and go through talking points. Uh, so I want to talk to them about how I feel about them first. Uh, second is uh, why I have confidence that American Express will be able to get through this because there were a lot of pundits who felt you have reliance on the travel industry. Uh, people are not going to be traveling. The company is going to be under siege. Our stock price had dropped substantially. And what I wanted to do was, one, deal with their personal needs, also deal with why I was confident that the company would succeed. And that was really a turning point for our company. We broadcast that and all around the world uh, because that was critical. And then literally four weeks later, I made an assessment defining reality of what was happening with the company, and I said, we're going to actually have to lay off 15% of our workforce. Right? So I'm expressing compassion to people, and then at the same time, I'm coming out to them, and frankly, the majority of my management team said, Ken, do not do it. This is, you can't do it. This, the organization is in turmoil, and I said, I don't think we have a choice. I don't think we can exist as a company if we don't do it. Uh, and here are the reasons why we need to do it, but I want all of us, including me, we're going to go out all around the world and explain the situation we're in, what the reality is, what we have to do, what the strategy is, how we're going to take care of our people who we are laying off, because we have an obligation and responsibility to them. And so what's important, I think, in a crisis is you've got to demonstrate, as I said, both compassion and decisiveness. And the key thing is to understand, and I said to each of the leaders, you are having an impact on everyone's life. So just understand that, that this is not just going through an analytical exercise that we need to lay off 15% of the people and you go on. You have that on your conscience of what we're doing, no fault of theirs, but at the same time, we're in an environment where we had to make choices. And you can stand still in that situation and fall back. So that's just an example to me of both the crisis and the challenge, defining reality, but also understanding how to move the company forward. So were, were there some innovations that uh, you were able to uh, develop as a team that kind of came out of this crisis and when you look back over the uh, tenure as CEO what would be three or four of the pivotal decisions you made around innovation and directing the strategy of the company so I would say the first one John absolutely which we had started on this strategy but we accelerated it more at that time 70% of the billings for American Express were in the travel and entertainment spending area. We'd started to move more uh, to what we called everyday spending. And here's an example of a company uh, in travel and entertainment spending. Your margins are substantially higher than they are in retail spending. And so, frankly, some people who took more of a consultant approach would say, you should stay in Teeny. The margins are high in Teeny. You should not expand into retail. So that was one of the debates in the company. And, uh, and I give Harvey credit. I was running the card business at the time. Gave him a recommendation. He embraced it. But then what I recognize is we have to accelerate this. Uh, and so what we were able to do in a four-year period is shift the billings mix to 70% everyday spending, 30% retail spending. And at the same time, re-engineer the company in a fundamental way. Yes. Uh, so that was one reality. The second was... I think, I think we were all probably pretty surprised when we showed up at Costco and uh, that's right. found we could use that's the right. American Express card. Costco, Walmart, and that was really, really important in driving the strategy. 
And then, John, I think one of the times I first talked to you was when we had come out with a loyalty program, mm -hmm. and that was something I was able to develop with the team, and I'd organize everything I've done has been with the team that was very involved, but we came through and developed one of the most innovative at the time re loyalty rewards programs, and it was called Membership Miles that became Membership Rewards that was very different at the time because unlike other reward programs in the 90s, it provided choice and programs didn't. They were generally affiliated with just one airline or one retailer. We grouped up a range of uh, loyalty partners to make that happen. Uh, and that, what I'm really proud of, that, that program, it's the most successful loyalty program in the world, and it's still growing. It's still growing uh, in a massive way. But I think what was critical about our strategy was we went from having three or four card products that had been incredibly successful to literally over 100 card products. And we engaged in a field that was not well known at the time of micro segmentation, uh, really applying data analytics to customer needs combined with the service ethic that was so strong in the company. Uh, that's really what was uh, the soul of the company, was service. Uh, that made an incredible difference for, for the company. But I would say the most important thing, and we talked about this a little bit, John, uh, is I think that where you're really judged, uh, and I'm proud of uh, what the company was able to do and all the people who contributed to the company, but I think the most important thing that you can do from a leadership standpoint is to create not just the business strategy and the business model, but a culture that really will endure. And so the thing I'm most proud about is I've been gone two years. American Express is doing even better. Uh, and they are growing uh, very well and the pundits have at different points in time kept on thinking that growth was gonna slow down, or that we were gonna have issues, and we did. But the whole issue is, how do you overcome it? And what I think is most important is the leadership that we were able to create in the company uh, that really endures, and so that's, to me, the most important. How do you run a team? I think what you've got to do is, and I really think from a leadership standpoint, one of the things that's most important in a leader, obviously you need integrity, obviously you need to be able to put together a strategy to see around corners, but I think what's most important in a leader is to have the willingness to also let other people lead. Uh, to not, in my view, try to take all the credit that part of what you're trying to do is to engender uh, a feeling of empowerment. And one of the things I would say at American Express and really believe is every single person in the company, no matter what their level in the company, had a choice to be a leader. I really want people to feel that they have a choice and actually to understand the impact that they can have on each other, on their customers, and on the company. Uh, and so I think the importance of both developing but giving people permission to be leaders, John, is uh, I, think, I think the core quality. But what I've found over time is people who have a very low level of self-awareness are not enduring leaders. And my philosophy of leadership is that if you want to lead, you have to be willing to serve. So I really do believe in the servant leadership model. And I believe that you lead by serving others. And that's why for me, American Express was a great match, and I 
considered myself very privileged to lead the company that a company that was committed to service, was aligned with my personal values, uh, but I think self-awareness is something that I think is absolutely so essential. Building on that, what, what would you look for when interviewing an executive for a job? So the first thing, the table stakes, is integrity. Uh, and for me, integrity is consistency of words and actions. We can't get anywhere unless the assessment is that that person has a high level of integrity. Uh, second is, I obviously look for leaders at different levels who are not just intelligent, but are intellectually curious. They want to learn. Uh, how can you say you want to be an innovator, but you don't want to learn? Uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, third, uh, I want people particularly who are going to be managing uh, large groups of people, I want them to be compassionate and decisive. Because one of the things I look for in a leader is does she or he have the ability to capture the hearts and minds of people because you want to engage people. You want to have them involved. So are they able to do that? Uh, and then I want people with courage uh, because you have to exhibit, if people are going to follow you, they want to know what do you stand up for? What do you believe? So. I want to know people's values. One of the things I ask people when I interview, tell me what you really believe. What do you stand for? What were one or two courageous things that you've done in your life, personal, business? I just think that's, that's really critical. And then I try to assess people who are resilient because things happen. And how do people respond? How do, they, how do they handle that? And then I also place a high premium on creativity because my philosophy is if you want to be a leadership brand or a leadership company, you obviously have to be creative. And, and creativity comes in many forms, uh, but that's something that I look for. Compared to when you first started, Facebook, Amazon, Google are much bigger and more right. important than they were. How, does a, sure. how, how would a company like American Express still attract the best and brightest talent? So here's what I think is important. Obviously, um, Amazon, Facebook, Google, amazing companies. One of the things that I think is important for all those companies is they're all going through at some point with varying forms of success or challenge is what's the second act, all right? So the disruptors have become, in certain ways, more like legacy companies. Some are adapting better than others on how to change. But if you look at a lot of these companies, what I always look at is what's your base business model and how much have you been able to innovate on the base business model? I don't know if it's gonna be five years or 10 years where they'll start to have issues, but it's going to come. So how have they been able to innovate? What's core to them? Uh, how do they diversify from that, but still have some common themes uh, that they're focused on? I think for American Express, I'll just go through briefly just some of the assets that we always focused on. So one we say and still say, because um, I stay in pretty good touch with my successor, uh, who's terrific. His name is Steve Squirry. Uh, worked with him for 28 years, is our brand and what it stands for. Uh, and uh, the American Express brand, to me, the way I think about great brands, is a great brands are a cluster of values, emotional and rational. And so what we try to do is really think about the emotional connection that we want to have with our customers in different customer segments, how their needs change, and what are the rational values. 
uh, because those rational values are so important. And then, in fact, what we've said is we really want to embrace change. So the digital transformation, we said we're going to create unique, differentiated relationships, whether we interact with customers online or offline. And we're going to embrace it. We're not going to be threatened by it. And people would say to me for years, is, is American Express concerned that plastic is going to go away, plastic card? I would say, I don't care. It's just a form factor. Now, at the end of the day, what we have is we have a set of rational services and benefits. We have data, and one of the great things about the Emerge Press business model is we have data on the individual corporate customer or the merchant, and then we have data on the merchant, and we understand <coughs> the behavior of individual transactions. Well, the ability, in fact, to integrate that data, which is something we're very focused on, so we were the first adopters of AI machine learning. Uh, so that's just a fundamental advantage. With our business model, that just gives us an advantage. And so we had to compete. <coughs> Visa is powerful. MasterCard is powerful. They have a virtual monopoly in the payments business. And people would say, well, how can you succeed? So I'll give you one example that just happened this year is we set as a target several years ago, and the perception is not there, but the, but the reality has happened, that in the United States, the merchant gap, all of you have had a card, know that there are places that don't accept Amex. Well, now in the United States, the coverage gap is closed, is closed. Um, and they've actually gone public, so I'm not giving any inside information, but people said it would not be possible. That's what people told me 10 years ago, it's not going to be possible. Three years ago, we said again in an analyst meeting, we're getting closer, and they said, hey, give me a break. It's not going to happen. And so the point there is that we've been able to leverage technology to give us some very important advantages. And despite the fact that the card business is very, very competitive, some of you probably have a Chase Sapphire card, good. That's good. Um, but the reality is that's an example. Very good product. But people said when Chase came out, Amex, the Sapphire card, it's going to hurt Platinum. What are you going to do? You're going to have to cut price. No, we raised price. We raised price because we continue to improve the value. So now we have better margins. We have more flexibility than Chase does in their Sapphire product because they can't raise price. They can't raise it. I'll bet you anything in the next two years that they will not raise price. Because if they could, they would have followed us. But they don't have the value. They don't have some of the capabilities. They have a good business. I want to be very clear. They have a good business. They're very good people. Many of them, most of them are ex-Amex people uh, <laughs> who were there. So, so they're pretty good. But, but the reality is that our strategy has been to leverage the unique assets that we have in this. So when I talked about the two data sets, we call that the closed loop, closed loop data. Overlay that with the technology and AI and machine learning has given us some really important advantages. What are you learning as the uh, managing director of General Catalyst that uh, you didn't learn in 37 <laughs> years at Amex? You know, here's what I would say. You know, one of the things, and this is really unique, and, and uh, it means a lot. David and I are, uh, we have a general partner meeting this week, and so things really uh, worked out for us. But I'll just digress a little bit, because it comes back to the importance of trust, uh, the intellectual curiosity uh, that I think I have for technology uh, the importance of relationships and serendipity. So I met David and Joel, I think it was a year before General Catalyst was formed. Uh, and they had invested in some travel businesses and a friend of ours actually brought us together <laughs> and connected and through the years, there's a company, if you look them up, that 
we both invested in, I did when I was at Amex, and they did, it's a company called Stripe, that's probably the most successful emerging payments company, and we fortunately both invested at a Series A, uh, early stage, uh, and, but through the years, David, Joel, and I talked probably 10 times, if not more, a year. And John, you know how crazy David is, and David shows up in all types of places. Uh, and so we developed a business relationship, but also a really strong personal relationship. Same with Joel, and then another partner we have in the firm is a person by the name of Hamont Tanasia, who's terrific. And so what we have that I think is very important in business that I would always say, no matter what size your company is, find three to five people that you totally trust, and you can accomplish amazing things. I really found that at American Express, that in uh, employees of 65,000 employees, people would say, how do you do it? Say, boy, if I just try to have five or 10 relationships, try to have great relationships with everybody, but five to 10 relationships of real trust, it just reduces friction, you don't have to worry about. So what we have at General Catalyst, one of the things I've learned is uh, to even more of the benefit that we have, that we have full and complete trust in each other. Second is to suspend belief, right? Because you go through some of these ideas and you say, give me a break. Uh, how is this gonna happen? And then the question is, you gotta trust the founder, and then you gotta trust your partner who's involved in that. And um, I would say that I've always been a proponent that speed makes a difference. And that's, I was very focused on that, is we gotta do things faster and quicker. And then what I really feel even more now is, boy, uh, the speed of things is unbelievable. And so where we would take a month or two, and we thought that was fast to evaluate doing a deal or an acquisition. In some cases, we'll do that in three days or a day. And so how do you force the hypothesis What's the logic? What's the construct? What's the criteria you're using? What I found is all that you can compress. Uh, doesn't mean you're always right, uh, but if you, if you have a disciplined approach with an entrepreneurial spirit, and David is one of, I came up with a term for him, he's the people alchemist. Uh, he sort of puts people together. Uh, and so you had two founders who started a technology VC firm who knew nothing about technology. That takes genius. Uh, so one is this combination of understanding of technology or lack of understanding, David, of technology, but an understanding of people and how to, in fact, invest in companies that can disrupt and change the world. You just did a... Um 157 million dollar Series D investment in a company called Guild. Could you tell us a little bit about that as an example? Sure. Uh, so that was an investment that I led. It's the largest investment the firm has ever done. And um, I get really passionate in general about things. And this is a company founded by a 31 year old woman. Uh, and I think it's going to transform workforce education in America. One of the most challenging things right now, there are 88 million Americans in the workforce that are either in educational programs or want to be educated. And what she's done is she's created a two-sided marketplace. So when I talked about the closed loop, American Express is a two-sided marketplace. We have card customers and issuers, and we have merchants. And what she's done is she's created a marketplace of academic institutions, and she's created a marketplace for companies. And the benefit is, her objective is, her name is Rachel Carlson. She's been obsessed with workforce education since she was 15 years old. 
When I met her, I said, Rachel, I was not obsessed with workforce education when I was 50. Um, other things I was obsessed about. Uh, but um, what she started off as a nonprofit, and what her objective is is to bring workforce education to workers all across this country. 60% of people in Fortune 1000 companies who are pursuing educational programs finish with $25 million in debt. She has set up a platform where people graduate debt free. Did you mean 25,000 in debt? 25,000 in debt, sorry, 25,000 in debt. And she's created a platform where people graduate debt free, which is incredible. The completion rate because remember, these are working people, white collar, blue collar, who are in educational programs, trying to get credential programs, software programmer, graduate high school, college, get an MBA, whatever. The completion rate in companies is 15 to 30 percent. Rachel's gotten it up to 80 percent. That is transforming. Disney, Walmart have now become a client uh, of Guild, and. Every single employee, because of the software platform, she's been able to improve the economics. Every single person gets an advisor counselor. And these advisor counselors are unbelievable. I mean, they are incredible. Uh, and so for us, the philosophy of the company, and one of the things that I've tried to do with the firm is to have us become even more intentional and what we do, and the, the firm has always tried to invest in companies that will really have a positive impact on society, but our mission, the GC promise, is that we want to invest in powerful, positive change that endures for our founders, for our people, for our investors, and for society overall. And Guild, one of the reasons why I like it is not just because I think it's going to be an incredible growth company for us with very, very good economics. I think it's going to profoundly improve society because 60% of the workers going for education are single women with children. 50% of that group are single women with children of color because those are the ones who had to drop out, right? family issues, personal issues, had to drop out of high school, college, graduate school, going to uh, coding school. So the impact on our society could be <coughs> fundamental. And so that is the type of investment that I've made a number of investments and I'm excited about those. But this one, uh, I think can really transform and that's what to me is so exciting about venture is not just you're gonna get a return from an investment or whatever, but building a company that will endure that you can look back on and say, this company changed the world or this company changed society. That is incredibly fulfilling to me. Okay, let's open it up. Um, question, one sentence ending in a question mark. Okay, let's, uh, <laughs> let's really stick to it because we don't have too much time. Um, let me go to the gentleman with the pink shirt. Don't let me down, sir, okay? All right. Think carefully. One, one sentence with a question mark. Can you walk me through a one-day valuation? A one-day? Valuation. <laughs> valuation? Yeah. yeah. I, okay. What do I think of a one-day valuation? I'm trying to... Now, you mentioned um, that in order... Sometimes speed. when you valuate a company and, oh, oh, and do make a difference. Yes, one-day yeah. valuation, yeah. So that doesn't happen often, uh, I would say. But I think what you want to do, and this is really important, I, I believe uh, that you manage by principles, you manage by criteria, you want to have a thesis. Uh, and one of the things I always tried to do uh, when I was at Amex, where I am now, is force the hypothesis, have a point of view. And so in that one day, the question is, how do you apply that criteria? Who are the people that you bring in, inside and outside the firm, to talk to, right, to get a perspective? Who are the people you say, 
I think this is a really good idea. Challenge it. Tell me why we shouldn't do it. Tell me why it's wrong. What am I missing? And then what you have to evaluate is judgment is really important. Taste, right? Because that's really critical. I mean, you can do the, all the analytics, and particularly in venture in early stage, what you can't do is analyze everything. And so what's the hypothesis? What's the logic? What's the criteria? What's the, what are the inputs you're getting from different types of people? What's your taste level? And then what you got to say is, I'm going to go. And the point is, in the venture business, it's the hits business. Uh, so, you know, in a hockey metaphor, how many shots do you take on goal? And you're not going to score unless you take the shots. So part of what you got to have is, is most of your investments, right, are going to fail. Or they'll just be okay. But so there are some really big ones that make all the difference. And then what did you learn from the failures? Uh, so I think you can make an informed decision in a day. I wouldn't do it a lot of times. But if the opportunity is there and you know if you don't move, it's going to be gone. Then you take the shot. Next one. Um, front row. Wait, wait for the mic, yeah. please. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Ken. We're all very honored to have you all tonight. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, you mentioned about your failures, right? So what is one failure that you had in venture capital, and what did you learn about it? If you don't so, mind. You know, I'll tell you, I, I have... Um, I'll tell you about, it's not a total failure, uh, but it, it, it could have been. And I can't mention the investment because it's still live and I don't like to talk bad about people. Um, but uh, this was, Dave, this would have been my first six months. And, uh, and we had, it was an interesting investment opportunity. It was in the health fitness space. Uh, and this is more about both allocation of time and making an assessment of the founder uh, that was there. And um, the point is that uh, I was excited about parts of the product. The founder, I thought, was pretty good. Uh, but I also had a little bit of a concern about some aspects of the founder. Not that they were dishonest in any way, but did they have the temperament and the attributes. But I got so enamored with the product. And, you know, in our environment, we argue, we yell, and people had different views. I would say David had a different view from mine uh, and expressed it. And I said, thank you, uh, useful input. Uh, but I think um, as a group, you know, we can still, still think we should go forward with it. And, um, and it's, so it's one of the things that we would have gone forward, except for the fact that I listened to some of my partners and I said, if I'm going to get more involved, my time as in each partner's time, is really valuable, we need to have a higher percentage. And the person said, all right, let me think about it, and literally over the weekend, retraded the deal. But the reality is, I was saved from making a very bad call because the behavior that the person exhibited was exactly what I was concerned about. Uh, and that would have been a real failure for me. And what would be important about the failure is the opportunity cost of my time. I'm not sure I would have been able to do the, the Guild investment because that investment, which would have had, I think, ultimately a lower return, but wouldn't be at the scale of success that I think Guild will be, I don't think I would have focused on that investment enough. 
so I haven't had a failure yet in venture, but that's just because I haven't been there that long. Uh, I'm sure I will have failures because I have now five investments and rest assured, I don't think everyone is gonna work even though I feel pretty good about them. Uh, but at uh, American Express, I'll tell you one failure that was a personal failure, right? People see me as very engaging, someone who cares about people, whatever, and so early, mid part of my career, I did treat people with respect, I like to engage with people, but one of the things we instituted at the company was um, upward feedback and uh, getting feedback from your peers. And uh, I was one who was really driven uh, and I like to work with people, but the feedback I got, there were always some things you did well, some things you did bad. Feedback I got was that I wasn't a good listener. And I said, how could someone say that about me? I'm a good guy, I, I care about people. I said, no, here's the deal, Ken. People feel that if you don't think they're saying something intelligent, you will zone out. In fact, they have a term for it. I said, what's the term? The Ken zone. He's in the Ken zone. <laughs> and so what I realized, I really thought, boy, that's really horrible. And they said, there, now there are two consequences of that behavior. One is people feel that you are disrespecting them, and they like you. So they feel really, really bad. And second is, you obviously are not getting any ideas because you're cutting people off in the first minute. If they're not saying something that you think is really intelligent. So of course, got the feedback, met with my coach, executive coach, put together my development plan. I said, all right, I'm gonna do this. Six months later, I went back to everybody. I said, so you see an improvement. <laughs> No, not really, uh, because perceptions are hard to change. So it took me two or three years for people to say, boy, Ken's become a good listener. And then people who didn't know the deal, that's why I would always tell the story, oh, Ken, you're such a good listener. So let me tell you what the real deal is. And so there are failures of personal leadership. And, um, and so I think about the impact I had on people, and some people that probably were devastated by that, that didn't realize that in their ambitions, that was a real failure on my part. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so are there any other students here who would uh, like to ask a question? Any, any more students? The la lady in the middle, can you get the mic to uh, the lady in the black and white dress, please, quickly? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering, so you mentioned the importance of resilience, and I was wondering uh, what have been some of the things that have helped you to cultivate your resilience? Is it certain things that you read or certain practices? Yes, yeah, so I'll say two or three points. One is, um, from a resilience standpoint, I think you really need to be clear about what your values and beliefs are. And, and you have to, in fact, be of the mind that you don't have all the answers, that you're not in this alone, because it's hard to be resilient if you don't think you have any support. And then I think of examples. So the most resilient person I know of in history is Nelson Mandela. And so for me, I like to personalize things, so I always try to think of who's better or who's had more challenges than I've had. And here's someone who was incarcerated for most of his life that didn't just survive but came out stronger and then led a whole nation to change. Uh, so having that example, but what it was was that intestinal fortitude and a understanding of the importance of values. Because you can't be resilient if you don't believe in anything. Uh, I don't care how many mental weights you lift. If you don't have 
the values, and you don't have those beliefs, you're not going to be resilient. But the way to be resilient also is to seek out help and support. Uh, and many people are afraid to be vulnerable. And again, they get confused of, well, I'm going to be strong if I don't tell people that I'm really having a tough time with an issue. That's like not very good self-awareness. So those are some of the ways that I've tried to be more resilient. Let, let, let's take uh, one more if there's another student. I'd prefer to go with a student if we could. Uh, the gentleman, uh, yes, right there, but just wait for the mic if you would, please. Uh, hello, Mr. Chenault, thank you for joining us. Um, just me, Ken. Okay, Everybody does, and I work <laughs> at a firm where the average age is probably 24 years old, David, so if they can call me Ken, you can call me Ken. All right, thank you, Ken, I appreciate it. Um, uh, you, you went to law school, um, right. and uh, I'm a law student uh, here at UN. Great. And um, I'm, I'm interested, what, what attracted you to the law, and then why did you leave uh, the law? Great, so I um, came in a really, grew up in a really interesting time. Uh, so I grew up, um, was born in 1951, uh, and you know, lived through the civil rights era and the Vietnam era, and uh, so I wanted to be a lawyer to have an impact on society. And one of the things I felt in business looking back is I wanted to be in something that would make a meaningful difference in people's lives, which is the way I think you want to look at business, is to make a meaningful difference in people's lives uh, through business. Uh, and so I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a civil rights lawyer. And, um, and I also was in an environment where I wasn't exposed to business. I didn't know a lot about business. I thought, you know, that's really not for me. That's not anything I conceived of. But what I think was important for me about law was I learned how to see arguments from different perspectives, which, was, which has been really, really helpful. And then how do you influence people to take certain actions based on your arguments? Uh, and that was critical to me. So I didn't, I think, I don't know about you, I think it would have been maybe even better for my development if there was a gap between when I went to college and law school, but I went straight from college to law school. So I was sort of in this uh, tunnel. And fortunately, I had a friend, I see one of my old colleagues, Eric Chris, who is here, and he was asking about a friend of mine, John Williams, and John said to me, did you ever think about business? And I said, I, I don't really have an interest in business. And one of the reasons why I ended up going to Bain and Company was Bain, I think at that time, was maybe five or six years old. It had this startup feel and really, really amazing people. And that was, frankly, more the attraction than what I knew about business is I felt an energy in the place. I uh, felt a dynamism that was really powerful. Uh, but it wasn't a question that I left the law because I was disappointed. I, I didn't know better. Uh, and so I had a, one of my best friends is one of the best litigators, a person named Ted Wells, who's co-head of litigation at Paul Weiss, which is a terrific law firm. Ted was the one who was going to go into business. And I was going to be the civil rights lawyer. Uh, and so one of the things I think about life is there's serendipity. Uh, and what you want to do is you want to be positioned to take advantage of that serendipity. So I think uh, legal training is really helpful, not just if you want to practice law, but you want to go into business. It just depends what your perspective and your attitude is. When uh, David asked you to take on this assignment, what did you think? Well, you know, here's back to the alchemy of David is David first broached this, I think it was at least 10 years before I stepped down from uh, American Express. And I said, David, please, you know, I'm, I'm not ready to think about that. And I don't think, 
I want to do that. And you know David. David uh, is relentless. Uh, relentless. And so we probably had, and I'm not exaggerating, probably 100 conversations at least uh, at different points in time. And then three years before I stepped down, and then two years, uh, we have a place out on Long Island. And David, of course, said, you know, why don't I come out? You know, I just want to talk to you about some business stuff. And of course, David said, no, Kent, look, you really, this is something you really, really got to think about. And what was important about this is um, when things seemed like this was something we we're going to move to, we did not negotiate at all. So my simple thing to David was, what did I say to you, David? Treat me like your big brother. Put something on the table. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, that's fine too, because I don't want to be, I don't want any aggravation in this next stage. I just want to do it because it's right, and if we got to get into an intense negotiation, it's not going to work. And that's one of the reasons why I think our, back when I talked about this in the beginning, the trust was so strong. Um, and the reason why I went into venture capital, frankly, was not let me select several venture capital firms. I had a lot of different, fortunately, options. It was really based on the people, the philosophy of the firm, and the fact that what we thought off of a very strong base and a base of success, we were talking about this on the car ride over tonight, um, as successful as the firm has been, the best days are really ahead of us. So I think, um, you know, we've had a lot of great speakers here in this room, but I think we've had 75 minutes of wisdom that this room has not seen for a long time. <laughs>